So I was always in a space of how do we support businesses in potential growth phases? And so part of that was how do we look at entrepreneurs in general? And what's unique, I think, about Wake Up in terms of the work we provide is we just don't look at the idea of economic vitality. We also look at the wellness of the entrepreneurs as well. A lot of emphasis in mental well-being. And that was long before uh, even COVID-19 happened. That was just a part of my personal attraction to the organization because there's a lot of focus on bringing your whole self to the business. As you mentioned, what does your family life look like? What does it look like building up opportunities and resources for your children, extended family? Um, and so one of the things we launched about a week ago, which is one of the initiatives that I'm spearheading, is called our lab sessions, which is learning and building. And out of those discussions, we discovered that one of the things a lot of the entrepreneurs, obviously, in addition to the financial support and assistance, is instead of well-being, anxiety, dealing with anxiety, uh, how do we deal with the psychological impacts, as you just articulated. And so we actually are ag aggregating data and information and stories in terms of how are you being impacted psychologically? What are the anxiety stressors, um, you know, uh, all those different levels in terms of challenges that we're working with. So we've, after these sessions, which we hold about every two weeks, uh, just the fact of people being able to get together and discuss and share and learn as a quick story. Uh, uh, one of the entrepreneurs uh, was a, applying for the uh, payment protection program, which I'm, I'm assuring a number of folks are aware of the big program that was launched to the SBA. And sometimes if you are applying and you're not getting the response or the engagement, you might think that maybe I'm not moving quick enough, I'm not moving fast enough, or you know I'm doing something wrong because you're not getting the response. Sometimes your businesses get turned down. And when they get to aggregate and connect with others, and th there's a similar stories, then at a minimum, they're understanding, oh, I'm not the only one that's going through this. And so just the opportunity to connect, just the opportunity to connect, independent of all the other things you mentioned, you know, how it's impacting family and friends and livelihood and, you know, just security and safety, literally tomorrow and the next week, just at that moment, being able to connect with other entrepreneurs and just engage and collaborate in terms of discussion and, uh, and, 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 and uh, sort of sharing of, where we are and why we're here has been very valuable. So that's what we've been doing in terms of just in the past two or three weeks in terms of addressing some of these issues. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to bring Mike and Donna into this conversation. Either one of you can jump in. But I had the pleasure of experiencing the 21 day story, the seven day sprint. And um, I thought it was quite fascinating in terms of the questions that were asked and the feedback that came from those that participated in it. So can you give us a little bit of information about that seven day sprint and what you were after with that seven day sprint? Mike, do you want me to give an overview? Uh, yes, okay. yes, you, Donna. <laughs> so our sprint format that we use, whether it's seven or 21 days, was it was born more than a year and a half ago, but we really feel like it was born for times such as these because um, it's meant to empower distributed and diverse groups of people. So when we invented this thing, we already had in mind people who weren't physically together necessarily and being able to bring them together in, Rasul, you had mentioned a safe space. When we think a safe space is always inclusive, Right, so we wanted to be able to utilize technology to be able to bring people together that way. And so during the course of one of our sprints, um, people participate via either their mobile device or their laptop. It's a, um, a dynamic web experience. We don't have to, they don't have to use an app or anything like that. So we make it really easy to interact with us. And we serve um, them a message that has exercises in it. And we call these story prompts. So we're immersing the contributors into a story on a daily basis throughout the course of the sprint. And this allows them to become immersed contextually into a posture of problem solving, which is a lot different than if we would just survey people. We want to posture them to empathize and to really seek to understand and help to alleviate the pain associated with the problem. And we do this through these story prompts that we serve. 
and they don't take more than 90 seconds or two minutes each day. And we feel that the way we take that delivery of what they have to contribute allows them to be psychologically safe when they're doing it. And we take that in at different times of the day and we call it honest data because we want the unvarnished truths to be coming through to us on a daily basis. And we feed those contributions forward. So they contribute first individually, but then that all converges on, on the group level. And and the, talk a little bit about the one you just did, because that was quite interesting in terms of the, the title. What was it, business? It was business <laughs> as unusual. Yes. <laughs> leading, leading in the new norm. And so, um, as we often do, Michael or I or Joe will have an idea, and, we, and I had texted Michael and I said, hey, let's run a sprint with as many people as we can gather up from around the globe, and let's try running it faster, because, you know, the sense of urgency, 21 days all of a sudden seemed too long, so we said, can we, can we do this in seven days, and so we did it. We brought 49 leaders from across different industries and academia together. Um, over the course of seven days, we did run all 21 prompts, which was really intense. Uh, Michael and I felt like we were back um, in our college days, burning the midnight oil every night. But we were able to bring together 49 strangers from across the world who had a common purpose that they shared. And that was, how do we become better leaders in the new normal? And what does the new normal look like and so all we do is support them with our framework to allow them to contribute at full potency and come together to co-create a story and a roadmap for how to solve the challenge of business as unusual mike i'm sure you want to add to that well i want to go back to yeah we we're interested in co-creation so there's a lot of opinions out there now in fact we're, we're drowning in opinions about this that and the other thing we're we're drowning in data in waves every day and a lot of it is contradictory you can find data that says the santa clara study by stanford university shows that uh the infection rate is not what we thought and then you can find another uh scientific you know uh, uh, a peer-reviewed paper or a paper that's in the process of being peer-reviewed that states completely the contrary and both can be true at the same time and so we've got to deal with this complexity and the way we deal with it with 21 day story is locally we're interested in the kinds of stories that in the what we call wicked problems that are actionable so a client cannot do anything about states or countries reopening policies generally speaking we don't know anybody that's that's influencing that or can do it at that scale what they can solve is what are our employees going to do? Or as Rasul said, how am I going to feed my family through the summer until we get back on our feet? And so we're interested in those problems and we don't have the solution. It's uh, we, we provide a framework for a group to get to the solution of something that they can actually act on. And that's, I think, very important in terms of what we do. So what was, what was one of your most profound takeaways from that exercise? I know you have, Kind of your summary data if you were to say something that you could share with people that in terms of the way forward in business yeah I can well i'll start, start I, i'll start and then donna you you can flesh okay. it out i i think the overall sentiment of begin with gratitude no matter where you're coming from or what your role is what kind of what the meeting configuration is where you're meeting how you're meeting begin with gratitude you know be be a better listener and and listen to people and be grateful for what your teams are contributing Donna. and one of the biggest insights that is true and i'll just add one more thing to that um, russell you talked about fear and fear is a really interesting character because we have fear when we're being attacked we have fear when we're under distress in times like these but we also tend to have fear when things are going really really well right because sometimes we get into the mode of the fear of you know what if this great thing ends and so forth and so we really just encourage um everyone and we encourage ourselves every day to 
think about questioning everything. And Russell, you started to go there, right? We have to rethink and question every single thing and not from a posture of insecurity or fear, but one from um, confidence in the new possibilities that are gonna come to bear. And that is much easier said than done. But I have found that that is one of the critical components from a mindset perspective that can really literally change your reality from one moment to the next. Um, May I add one more thing, Linda? Sure. The single most uh, consensus-oriented response of the, of the whole seven-day sprint was around one idea. We wanted to find out, as any good story does, what is the obstacle to achieving the objective? So the objective is uh, be a better leader, let's say. The single biggest objective, 54% of the 49 people said <clears throat> the return to the old status quo is the biggest so you know when rasul's talking about these small businesses really every there's two things about it that struck out for me um every business whether it's small or large is in the same boat it's not just small businesses that are stuck with this and to get going again what worked in the past for a small business big business will not work in the future they have to be adaptive now in a way that being small they can and nobody knows this better than you rasul so you know i think you're in they've got the right man in the right place at the right time so kind mike thank you sir thank you thank you so true okay. donna you mentioned i think uh fair was it donna that mentioned fair as a um as one of the um, big issues yes so this is also one of you know when we look at whether or not the U.S. is going into um, a great depression, a great recession. One of the things that some of the economists predict is that the fear of what's to come can actually create what people are fearing. So, are we hearing a lot of uh, are we hearing a lot around a fear of a depression or a recession? And any of you can jump in and answer this. So, um, Rasul, have you been hearing anything in terms of in the small businesses, or is that a, a real fear of people? Um, repeat the question again. I'm make sure I understood completely what you're or asking. Fear is there a fear, for instance, among small businesses and entrepreneurs around what whether we're going into a recession or a depression, mm -hmm. economic recession or depression? Um, the groups that we work with, uh, one of the things that wake of I enjoy so much and it reflects a lot of the work that 21 Day Story is doing is like, how do you tap into this ecosystem, right, of collaborators, businesses, business leaders, and Wake Up is just phenomenal in that regard. I mean, our ecosystem that we work with, our partners, our current clients who actually acts as partners as well, um, are actually phenomenal in terms of uh, when an opportunity presents itself, uh, do we sort of, sort of, uh, cower in despair or do we look at this as an opportunity to sort of look at it at a, at a different angle to sort of understand in a different kind of dimension versus historically this is where we've been uh, this is what the ultimate reality is going to be but how do we sort of look at that in a potentially transformative way and matter of fact one of the phenomenal organizations that we're working with uh, which, was, which was launched in 2018 and they're actually one of our initial partners in our lab sessions was uh, the DMB Black Restaurant Week. Uh, two of the founders, Farrar Tate and Dr. Uh, Aaron, uh, two individuals that couldn't be more positive, uh, especially in today's current environment. And I wanted to connect with them because they literally saw the opportunity to rally the troops, so to speak, here in DC. Um, and so just within those individuals and just touching them, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even feel that in a depression uh, a pandemic which was routing that, you know, the whole impetus around that was even literally nipping at our, 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 our toes and, and hitting up the, side of the head and literally just banging us on the shoulders every moment. And so in our space, the folks that we work with and uh, as, as African Americans historically, you know, we, we've always been under pressure in a lot of different ways. And so when this kind of happens, it kind of, we kind of kick it into to, to that third or fourth or fifth gear, so to speak. And it's just like another opportunity to say, how resilient are we as a people? 
And so in, in our experience, uh, which has been, I mean, so, so just enlightening and just been such a breath of fresh air, uh, just a positivity that they've sort of embraced this environment with has been, uh, you know, lots of folks are just so down, uh, anxiety driven because of, of obviously what's transpiring, but in a lot of ways, significant parts of my day are pretty joyful, to be honest, in spite of other stories that obviously people are challenged and just, uh, just, in comprehensible ways, but a number of our partners in our ecosystem are just taking this head on and really sort of jumping into it all the way up to the neck. Just working through this with a lot of joy and this determination to succeed at all costs. So that's what I'm actually seeing in a lot of ways in the work that I'm engaged in. Okay, good. So um, Mike and Donna, um, what have you seen in terms of like some of the language that you've been hearing and how that might actually shape how people are thinking and processing what's happening now? We, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we always encourage people to turn things into questions, right? Mm -hmm. Because as you just said, do we, do people expect to go into an economic recession or depression? There's going to be varying degrees of reality of that based on someone's you know unique circumstances and you know this is disruption at a global level so as we think about the possibilities turning things instead of saying we're going into a depression we've got to like bear down for that um we really encourage the organizations that we work with to turn everything into a question so that we open up that space and that's really the uh, best way to counteract fear as well is through curiosity. Curiosity is a really great antidote to fear. And so a lot of what we're hearing, wh when I work with companies who want to transform, right, they're either on the brink of demise or they're on the brink of better greatness, but the brink is the same. They just don't realize it. It's your perspective on it. And so we really um, encourage the embracing of that disruption so that they can bring themselves to a state where they're open to the possibilities. As Mike mentioned, the biggest thing that came out of that sprint was the inertia of the old normal is the biggest obstacle to the new normal. And so we've got to get ourselves out of a state where we're, you know, doing the obvious things. Um, all, every single company we've talked to, they're, they're trying to hurry around digitizing status quo. Right? They're like, what are the things that we used to do? Well, we have to hurry and preserve those. The best way to do that is with technology. And we really need to like go to the roots of what it is that we want to create in the new normal and make sure that we're just not doing um, a shined up version of the old way. Um, so we're hearing a lot of people like jumping to that conclusion, but once they get over that hurdle, if we can encourage them to open up that space and, and question everything, we could start to really get our arms around a transformative new normal. We and, can have meetings <clears throat> that are just as bad on Zoom as they were in a conference room. <laughs> <clears throat> just as boring, same games, same leader arriving late and everybody sitting there working on their phone. You know, it's the, uh, you so, but now is a chance to replace some of the, the bad habits. I want to I want to go back to the quote Linda that you began our session with. And if if we look at you can look around you right now that plant behind you the books in the bookcase the end dust on my desk it's all there because it began with a thought. Everything that's around us everything we can touch everything that moves in the world begins with a thought about that thing. And this so, so any recovery has to begin with a thought about that recovery. So people like those that Rasul cited, we can't ask people to be a certain way, but, but there are people who are adept at envisioning that putting those thoughts in motion. And this is gonna sound like I'm a paid publicist for Rasul Shair. I assure you there is no uh, transaction around this. I just replaced Tron with Rasul and it's like a one-to-one, -one. but we're, we're here today in this session, I am because of a thought that Rasul Shair had in 2008, early 2008. And it was curiosity. He's going, who's this dude out in LA writing about improvisation for business? And I'd never heard of Rasul Shair before, you know, uh, out of the blue, here comes a guy. And within a year, he we were visiting. 
and hanging out. And that was an inflection point that that led to this. It began with a thought. And then a couple of years ago, I was in a, I, I gave a presentation on storytelling in DC for a bunch of media folks and Kareem Ali comes up to me afterwards. And I had used the word equality in my presentation. It was one of the simplest and most profound conversations. This was the first profound conversation. He came up to me and he goes, think about what would happen. This was you and Jamal, Kareem. Think about what would happen if you replaced the word equality with the word equity. And that's all he said. We didn't discuss it. We didn't go any deeper into it. But I was like, for days afterwards, I was going, wait a second, the whole world shifted for me. And my understanding of narrative and, and who you know, owns a narrative, quote unquote, who has equity in a narrative, because we always think of equity as an outcome. Equity is also a design. It's there for a reason. It's there because somebody had a thought about how the pie should be sliced. And now we have a chance to bake a new pie and think about slicing it in a different way, in a more equitable way. So I think, you know, the, the thinking about it and the, using curiosity as the lever into those new thoughts, asking questions, um, knowing that two things, we're not alone and we're still here. A friend of mine said that last night in a writer's workshop, Peter J. Harris, who's a poet, who is the, um, a child of D.C., uh, his brother was a DJ, famous sports DJ, uh, Kareem, you know who he is, but uh, with PD Green and, and he goes, we're still here. And I cling to the strength of my African-American friends and especially the women. It's been 400 years. We're sitting here looking at, uh, oh man, it's been a rough six weeks. It's been over 400 years and we're still here. And I just take a ride on that strength. I take a ride on the persistence and the resilience and the, the positivity, the light that can shine through the worst of hardships. And uh, that's for me personally, and we feed that as much as we can into 21 Day Story, that vibe. And um, so, you know, but it begins with, with thinking. It goes back to your first quote. That's everything. Now, what? Mike, I'm gonna let you keep the mic for a little bit. <laughs> so now you- You're gonna be sorry. <laughs> you mentioned that your involvement with the movie Tron. Yeah. So are you seeing anything in that movie that informs what we are currently experiencing? <laughs> there it is right there, Tron. Um, Absolutely. You know, there's a, it's, I didn't realize it until uh, a couple of weeks ago and Donna goes, what, what are we going to put on the blog post? And I go, you know, I, Steven Lisberger, who directed and created Tron, the movie Tron had this saying that he came up with around the time of Tron, the sequel Tron legacy a few years ago. And he goes, Tron came true. And he kept saying, what happened was Tron came true. And, you know, we are, conceptually we kind of understand that is that oh we're living in a virtual world like we're all on the game grid video games are big you know esports is big so i kind of shelved that thought but i've been thinking about it a lot lately and that was a that was a character the story was about a character who was seeking equity for what he had created and he had to go into this virtual realm to right the wrong and he found that everything in the virtual world was uh, an avatar of the physical world. So the, 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 the malicious CEO in the real world was the arch villain in the virtual world. The cubicles were replaced by the game grid. And it was still like fight for your life on the game grid. So I think the opportunity is to take Tron as a cautionary tale and go, you know, let's not do what happened there and recreate the physical world in a in virtual space it, go, it goes back to what donna was saying let's not bring the old bad habits with us let's use this as an inflection point you know people have been here before uh on a community level for sure communities have suffered disasters and come back strong and we have to look at local models we have to find our first thoughts best thoughts most innovative thoughts as locally as we can, as frugally as we can get to innovation, we need to get to it. So I don't even have any idea whether that answers your question or not, Linda, but uh, that's my riff. 
it does I mean, it does and what i'm actually hearing is that you know what and and seeing as well is that a lot of a lot of individuals a lot of businesses are basically repackaging the same thing and just trying to do it in a trying to do it in a in a virtual space you know i i i can I became a vegan, took on a vegan diet quite a few years ago. And one of the things I started doing is I started veganizing <laughs> all of the old recipes and saying, you know, how do I make macaroni and cheese <laughs> with all the vegan ingredients? And that's what kind of came to mind when, you know, in this conversation that we're basically digitizing the same bad ways. That. Have you seen uh, rabbits and wolves on Instagram? Do you follow rabbits and wolves? That some of the best vegan recipes you will ever see. <laughs> Little sidebar. Sorry, everybody. Not just sidebar. <laughs> Talking food. Talking food. Sorry, sorry. But but yeah. But are we seeing that kind of thing now, where where that's essentially what we're doing, as opposed to rethinking? And you know, how do we begin to rethink things so that there is that more equitable distribution of wealth and where we will find that there is more equity in what we're doing in businesses in America. And I'll um, ask Rasul to maybe chime in there. Let me see. So Rasul. Um, I really, yeah, sure. I really love the way Donna sort of posited the idea of part of the building blocks of this is curiosity. A quick backdrop a little bit further for me is my impact on curiosity and how it impacted me was dramatically shaped. I was actually in the Peace Corps um, uh, in Southern Africa, Namibia to be specific, uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, right around the fall of apartheid. Um, and Namibia was Southwest Africa at the time, uh, right above South Africa. And talk about the requirement and necessity of, of being curious. Uh, if you come to uh, any foreign country, South America, Middle East, what have you, with any preconceived notions or trying to repackage your own thoughts to have them sit and exist in the same way, hmm. Madam, sir, you will be very disappointed and hurt and confused and struggling in all kinds of ways because it just doesn't fit, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and so one of the things that I sort of personally had to sort of unpackage to a certain degree was you know one of the things that's pervasive in the United States, the idea of obviously some people coined it or sort of mentioned that apartheid was slavery on steroids, as an example. And so you hear that, you know, you sort of, as an individual like myself, you go into that country, or that environment, and so that sort of sits in a certain kind of way. And as you have to ask questions, at least a, a person who is really trying to understand the nature of the context and the culture and the stories that sit there. Uh, you begin to slowly discover that, oh, this is not, we're not in Kansas anymore, so to speak. And the idea of what slavery meant in post-apartheid uh, 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 South Africa and what it meant in the United States, juxtaposing of sort of these two realities was just, just absolutely phenomenal in terms of uh, requiring me to rethink what, you know, the idea of what it meant to be an American, what it meant to be a volunteer, what it meant to be uh, an African-American, what it meant to be living on the continent. And quickly you learn that I need to ask a lot of questions. I really need to be, as Donna had said so, so eloquently, extremely curious. Um, and if you're not doing that, as you just said, are we just repackaging stuff? Because we're not wondering, can we do something better? We're not wondering, can we do something in a slightly different way that might bring a different kind of experience? Uh, so for me, it's just like that curiosity piece is absolutely essential. And I don't have the answer to this, like how do you drive curiosity within individuals? Uh, but I've always been a personal believer that if we truly believe in innovation, so to speak, or if we look at sort of recalibrating our thought process, you have to be curious. Because if you're not wondering about how are they doing it over there, is it different than what we're doing, what I'm doing, or how are they moving through the forest over here versus there, then you're not really creating the opportunity to sort of learn, you know? Uh, and so for me, that's, as a lifelong student, um, that's one of the things that's absolutely essential. Uh, once again, as Mike pointed out, I was like, who's this dude writing about surfboards and Sufi writers 
in Australia. That was a blog post that I was just like, who's this, this, who's this, who's this guy in California, you know, talking about this stuff. And I was curious and I didn't, I had zero expectations. Eh, he's not going to hit me back. Hollywood guy, blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't know this little dude up from Washington, DC, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't even 48 hours and hit me back and said, Hey, I'd love to talk. And you know, all these years later, we still constantly sort of riff and improvise and around curiosity and learning and new opportunities. And so once again, just, I, I can't even stress Donna in terms of that space, in terms of she hit, in terms of curiosity is such a cornerstone in terms of where's the real value that we're either missing or real value that being created. And that's the idea of what are we, can we do differently or where can we expand our curiosity to create different spaces that allow us to really go where we would, where we're trying to go or makes more sense to go. And, and, and uh, Russell, I'll just, I have to share that I had a very similar experience with South Africa. Mm -hmm. I lived in South Africa for two years and that was in the um, early nineties. And it was the same type of thing. I thought that I could go into South Africa and I thought it would be a lot of similarities because of apartheid in the African American experience with slavery. And, and it does require for you to, to rethink and understand that you cannot just plant your experience into someone else's experience without, without understanding it. So I just wanna echo that that was for me also that being curious and understanding that when you're going into a new space to try to do things in a new space, you really have to be in that space and in that time and not back where you were physically or in time. And that's, and I think that's also what I heard, you know, Mike talking about as well is that, you know, when people want to get back to the status quo, when the status quo is the past. <laughs> there was a, um, you know, another quote that I, and I don't have the quote right in front of me, but it's, you know, we can't change, you know, we, we can't really change what's in the past. The only way to really to reveal the secrets is to push play. So we got to push play to move forward. And so my question to any of you can kind of jump in is where do you see this way forward? for for us um, for businesses how do we begin to shape and influence not just kind of step into this is the new reality but how do we begin to shape this new reality not everyone at once <laughs> <laughs> go ahead donna <laughs> i was just gonna say we we could definitely shape offer me a copy of um, the roadmap that was um, co-created by the 49 global leaders. Um, it offers some, you know, good practical um, advice, but also, you know, provokes in a way that, you know, some, a leader could choose to say, eh, you know, whatever, you know, humanity, eh, what's that? No, it's all about humanity. It's always been about humanity. It's even increasingly, you know, the more digital this world becomes, the more critical the human to human interactions are going to be um, as part of that mix. And so really taking the time, as Mike said, simple things like gratitude and opening up space. There was someone who um, recommended letting someone else make a decision that you typically would, you know, leaders going to have to overtly trust their people and hope that they can earn the trust back of their people in this new realm of reality. Um, I wanted to, something that occurred to me as you guys were talking, one of the economic um, aspects that came to bear in the sprint really was around closing the gap between the highest paid organization or the highest paid individuals and in organization and the, fr the essential front line. And the front line's always been essential, but the way we recognize and show gratitude toward the front line is going to have to change because there's no going back um, to where we were and how things used to be. Yeah, and I, th I think we've seen too that that front line has become the essential workers. Yes. And, and so where we may not have put a lot of value, I now regularly, when I go into the supermarket, 
I thank the cashier mm -hmm. for coming to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, because that is just something that we have typically overlooked the impact and the significance of those that are out on the front line. And I think leadership has, has also done that. But you, we can see that these are the essential workers now that are providing us with the things that we need in order to live and thrive. Right. I want to give you a snapshot from my Disney days about what old equity design looked like. There was a guy my age who was an executive on the business side of things. He had abandoned his uh, dreams of being a filmmaker to go for the money, essentially. Not that he sold out, he had a family and all of that. This was a career choice. So he told me one day we just optioned this screenplay for $250,000 and I got the option for a dollar. And I, I was an aspiring screenwriter at the time and go $250,000, like that writer just scored that right, wow, $250,000 for a screenplay. And he goes, no, 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 we're never gonna exercise the option. We just wanted to tie it up because we have a similar property here and we didn't want this getting out to another studio. And I started to think about the rift between this inside game of where the equity was $1. You got $1, that's all you're ever gonna get versus what was going on in that writer's house, that screenwriter, probably a young screenwriter going 250 and the, the amount of heartache that lay ahead for that writer, for whoever that was, the illusion that there was wealth that was gonna be generated in some way when there was never any intention. So that was a long time ago, but that began this like divide for me so that when Kareem Ali and Jamal Williams said, hey, think about the word swap, that one word and the implications. And so we began collecting language. Uh, over the past three or four years, the Profound Conversation Group, we call it the social architecture of language. And I'm gonna give you my favorite word swap because it's the simplest. And it, and it has to do with equity. Think about what would happen if you replaced the word the with the word a. Uh. So every time you were tempted to say the solution, you say a solution. Every time you're tempted to say the idea, you say an idea. It invites participation and, it, and it's a way for your story and my story to become our story. And whatever the story is gonna be in the future, it's gonna be our story. It's not gonna be any, anybody's idea that they've got right now, anybody's script for it. It's gonna be a way that at a very local level, we look each other in the eye, we listen, we're curious about one another's narratives and histories and, and, and your story and my story become our story. And that's, that's really the business we're in when you get right down to it is how do we take these individual strands of narratives and perspectives and weave them together so that at the end of 21 days or a seven day sprint, we have a, a group has our story. And that's the most powerful thing that we can do right now yeah. is create that mechanism. And, and how could those that's, that's listening get access to that seven day sprint? Is that something that's going to be publicly available? Or is this something we can share out? Yes, we, we can, uh, we'll send you a link that anyone can sign up to receive a copy of the roadmap. We did it with that intention that we could share it and our, the people who contributed could share it um, with as many people as possible. Okay. Okay. All right, so um, I'm curious as to whether or not, well, I mean, we're going to keep this conversation going a little bit longer. We have about 10 more minutes. So I will, uh, um, if anyone has any questions, if you can type them in the question box and we'll, we'll keep talking. And if we see some questions, I'll ask Erica to just kind of chime in and, and let us know that we have some questions for either Donna, Mike, or um, Rasul. But um, one, of the th one of the things that I heard in this conversation was around resiliency. And I think that was, I think that was Rasul that talked about resiliency. And, you know, a lot of work that's done like for wellness professionals is that they do a lot of work in training people on resiliency. And is that something that, that you see in terms of the small businesses and the entrepreneurs where there was an opportunity for them to get some, some 
some work on how to be more resilient in these times. Uh, it's interesting. There was a friend of mine on Facebook who, uh, in her experience, she's out in California, Mike's neck of the world, and she works in prison populations, I believe, in terms of support in a number of different ways. And she was having this negative response. And I guess a lot of the conversations around resiliency and people were using it in a way that uh, just wasn't supportive or wasn't generative. And she had a, just a lot of just anger around the way it was being used. And my response to that uh, was like anything, sort of what's the story that we're using resiliency in the context of, right? Because me and Mike, we've talked about this for years in terms of you know, content, people talk about content is king, but we also believe that a part of that discussion is content or context, excuse me, is king. And how you're using your resiliency really is very, can be powerful in terms of the context. How are you using that? And in our context, in our content, our context is an ecosystem, which once again is so much of the work and so powerful in terms of what we're doing at Waketh, that the idea of resiliency, and it's, it's a word we throw out there, and so what do we actually mean by that? Um, and part of that is in a way understanding this idea of, of Mike kind of hit on, on an earlier side, idea of equity, you know. And with Wake If, part of what our belief is, is that in order to create prosperity for communities, we have to create equity, the opportunities for equity to own, you know, not just equality to be treated fairly, which is a different conversation, but of course is vitally important. But in that equality narrative and story, how do we own the ability to own our ownership in that? And that's what essentially as a part of just the DNA of the work that we do at Wake It. Like we're creating opportunities every single minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month of the year to figure out how do we create equity for these individuals to own and to creating their own trajectory in life to the best of our ability. And so part of that resiliency is creating the opportunity for them to own that. What does that mean to be resilient? That means being able to have, to the best of our ability, the ability to create our own determination. And entrepreneurship is an avenue uh, that we, that we are obviously are in. Uh, and so in a way, that's one of the uh, sort of a way that we look at this idea of resiliency, not necessarily in traditional or conventional in terms of resiliency, in terms of we're gonna survive, we're gonna move through this thing, but in terms of resiliency, in terms of how do we at a very DNA level, how are we creating before the conversation gets started, the idea of what are the building blocks that we need to be, because as any entrepreneur can speak to, Donna can speak to this, Mike can, uh, Linda, you can as well, in terms of you mentioned earlier about the multiple businesses as a serial entrepreneur. You know, how do we, as entrepreneurs, we are resilient just by the nature of it. You know, we get thrown stumbling blocks all the time. I mean, speed bumps are a way of life. Sometimes speed mountains, <laughs> uh, which you got to just not just roll over, but you got to figure out how to dig under it or, 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 or go around it or whatever it may be. So in terms of from our perspective and my perspective, resiliency, a part of that conversation is really how do we begin to look at the idea from the jump, so to speak, of creating the opportunity and the ways for equity to, to develop that for ourselves. So have, are we in a situation where this um, current current environment has can be categorized in terms of business as maybe a great equalizer do you think that it's going to bring in and of itself that it will bring any equity and new opportunities that people may not have otherwise had and that's for any of you to answer i'm interested in rasul's response to that because he's yeah, I, I, yeah, I, th I think what what I always like to say is this: that at a minimum, I don't have the answers to to the world's greatest problems and challenges. Uh, and everyone who says that they come to the table so that they do, I'm it'd be extremely uh, hesitant to jump on that boat and take a ride across the river with them. But what, <laughs> the, the, at, at at a at a at a minimum, I always I like to that. I, I taught him that. Did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, go on. Underneath the table, I'm, I'm giving Mike his uh, 50 bucks for that. Uh, and so one of the things I'm always is like, what's out there for us to consider? You have to, what is out there for us to consider? And so at a minimum, the consideration is what happens in the world, right? When our small businesses, uh, mom and pops, 
uh, entrepreneurs, what happens when that world dries up or it, it, its impact is disrupted? And we literally have with that happening right now. Uh, and so, and when it comes to business and the individual, it's like the entrepreneur is sort of that interesting space where like humanity and for this particular conversation, kind of business kind of sort of converge. And what does the, the, the rugged individual look like? And what does that rugged individual narrative look like when it requires collaboration, which business does, and especially now with the pandemic. And so that's sort of how I think about the question you just asked, Linda. It's just like, how do, if we consider what's happening now, you know, what would the eventuality be hypothetically if all this activity were to decimate? And that is an extremely, extremely sobering thought. So at a minimum, that becomes considering that. And so how do we, what do we need to do to ensure that doesn't happen? Or what do we need to do to sort of begin to look at the remedies to uh, make sure that that doesn't become an eventuality on some form in some fashion? And the way, you know, the way I'm thinking about it is like when I look at, you know, once people started going online, you know, when the internet became a real viable space, it actually created a lot of opportunities for people to get their music out because they didn't have to beg record labels. It, um, because they could actually put their music out there without asking someone else's permission. The same thing you had with authors, people begin to self publish as opposed to having to convince a publisher that someone wants to hear my work and is worthy. And I'm wondering whether or not some of these opportunities will arise now that now that you know business is going to be different I mean, some of the requirements in terms of the capital outlay you may have needed to be you know to be physically present to get on a plane to attend certain meetings in person to be able to to put your word out in a professional studio setting and now here we are on zoom so and those are the kind of things where i'm wondering whether or not this new reality actually is going to create opportunities where the entry costs might be a little bit lower to be able to engage. So if you look at the um, cost of media production, let's say, so there's an industry I'm familiar with, cost of media production is very, very low. Um, it, it, so there's the barrier to entry that was always there when I began, you had to get a crew, you had to hire a camera person, you needed a sound person, a gaffer, you know, you're pulling three or four people around minimum to do to go just get anything on video. And now what do you do? You pull out your phone and and you're getting uh, motion picture quality practically with your phone. So that's one example. What, what I was thinking of when Rasul was talking is, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of quantum physics in the storytelling work we do. In fact, it's called quantum storytelling in academic circles. And I'm far from being able to do the math behind it, but a quantum physicist will tell you something along the lines of a small amount of intelligent input into a chaotic field can have profound outcomes. So I think small structured inputs into the chaos, the key thing is the structure because you can improvise out of structure. You can't improvise when the entire environment is improvising like it is now, you, you can't improvise your, you know, you can't go in with, with a totally improvisational and, you know, like made up, like invention mindset. You've got to go in with a very specific structure in mind and, and adjust out of that. So I think, you know, Rasul in talking about these small businesses, they're going to be more agile. They're going to be quicker to act. They can create the small intelligent inputs. A cruise line cannot do that. A cruise line is is worried about what's going to happen to these ships. What about that island we just bought and the and the the boat that's at the shipyard that was going to cost us a billion dollars? Best idea I've heard about that is sell them to the Saudis as yachts. Sell all the cruise ships to the Saudis as yachts. Thought that was a good idea. Anyhow, um, small amount of intelligent input into a chaotic field is a key and, and we help people do that. I don't know if Donna probably has a correction of that or some no, yes I, and I, you do I, the yes and yes and these these this is the 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 environment that's ripe for innovation to occur. 
people are definitely going to rise and innovate and that opportunity presents itself to the largest and the smallest of companies. Right. I think, I think that that's a nice positive note to end on. <laughs> We are at the top of the hour, and I want to profoundly thank our panelists, our um, conversationalists, Donna, Mike, and Rasul, for participating in today's profound conversation, and to also thank our, um, our engineer is um, Erica Christie and my two um, business partners that help make profound conversations happen, and that is Kareem Ali and Samuel Sharif. And certainly, we always thank all of you that have tuned in to today's episode of Profound Conversation, and for those that will tune in later to listen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. I appreciate your time.